All right. Hey, everybody. I'm here with uh, Christian apologist and scholar Jonathan McClatchy. We're going to be talking about uh, an exciting new ministry project that Jonathan is doing called TalkAboutDoubts.com. And we're going to be talking about how you can address your doubts uh, in a way that I think is intellectually um, honest with yourself as well as in a healthy kind of way. Um, because I get a lot of questions and comments and emails from some of you guys. And I know that doubt is something that is a normal thing. It's a common thing. And the way that we handle it, though, um, can be very, very important. And so, Jonathan, for those who might not be familiar with your work, can you tell us a little bit of some about like your ministry and your academic background and all that? Sure. So I have a PhD in biology from Newcastle University in England, and I currently work as an assistant professor of biology at a Christian college called Sattler College in Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States. And I uh, have been active in apologetics for a number of years, uh, over a decade. Uh, I've done a lot of work in the intelligent design community. I interned for a year at the Discovery Institute between 2012 and 13, was involved in doing editorial work for Stephen Meyer's book, Darwin's uh, Doubt, and I'm now a fellow of the Discovery Institute. And I also have uh, turned my hand to other uh, fields, including New Testament scholarship, and I'm very interested in the reliability of the Gospels and Acts uh, and the case for Jesus' resurrection. I'm also very interested in Christology and the Trinity and Islam and uh, arguments for messianic prophecy and answering Jewish objections to Jesus. So there's a lot of things that I uh, have turned my hand to and I've done a number of debates, I think over 50 moderated debates. Um, and I'm very I'm active um, as a writer as well. You can find my much of my writing at jonathanmcclatchy.com. Um, and click on latest writing and you'll find a lot of my articles and various subjects. And um, as you said, uh, I've just launched this new ministry called talkaboutdoubts.com, which is basically attempting to um, uh, provide a service where we connect Christians who are struggling with doubts with um, some of the world's top scholars and experts and thinkers on those various topics that people struggle with. So we're, um, we're a ministry that seeks to um, how to um, facilitate one-on-one -on -one conversations between Christians who are doubting their faith and Christian scholars and experts. Awesome. And yeah, I think this is absolutely an amazing and much needed resource. And because I get tons of questions, um, like I mentioned in the intro there, and sometimes it's like questions that I personally can't answer because they'll be maybe something related to scientific kind of questions, objections or things like that. And you just have like people from like a diverse kind of backgrounds. Um, can you give us like some of the names and, and some of the maybe backgrounds of some, the experts that you've enlisted to kind of help you out with this endeavor? Sure, so we have, uh, for example, Dr. Timothy McGrew, who is a well-known philosopher. Uh, he's a professor of philosophy at Western Michigan University. Uh, we also have Dr. Luke Barnes, who's an astrophysicist, a very well-known astronomer, um, who's based in Sydney, Australia. And uh, he's uh, widely considered one of the leading experts on the fine-tuning argument. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Casey Luskin, who's a geology PhD, who's uh, um, the associate director of the Discovery Institute. We have um, um, yourself as well, of course. Um, we have uh, Wesley Huff, who is a uh, uh, PhD student in New Testament studies at the University of Toronto. Very, very bright guy. Uh, one yeah. of the brightest people in the world, in my opinion, on New Testament issues, especially textual critical issues relating to the New Testament. So there's just a few examples. We actually have more than 40 people on our team now as well. So for, and we're still growing. Yeah, absolutely. And for those of you guys who don't know, Wesley Huff has got a very underrated uh, YouTube channel as well. Like I don't know why he doesn't have more subscribers. I know he doesn't post a ton, but you guys check out Wesley Huff's YouTube channel. I'll put it in the description down below because he's just got a lot of, of really good and helpful videos. Um, and so one where he kind of deals with Joe Rogan shenanigans with everything being like Jesus is a the mushroom cult and all this weird stuff that's actually pretty funny. So uh, definitely check that out. And so, um, so how did this project come about? Like, how did you get started with this thing? Where did it come from? Sure. So I've been doing this uh, ministry on my personal website since 2016. And uh, on my personal website, I would get about one or two requests per week. And more recently, I decided to launch 
a, a bigger ministry, which would uh, develop what I was doing already into more of a team effort. And uh, I, I want, I, I've watched literally hundreds, if not thousands of deconversion testimonies on YouTube. And I, I've often been very frustrated by just some of the really shallow and bad reasons that people have for leaving their faith. And I, you know, have, I, um, I've for a long time had a burden to talk to people who are struggling with devs. And also I, I talked to a lot of ex Christians as well and try to assuage their concerns through rational discourse and present to them what are to my mind, some very compelling evidences that in fact suggest that Christianity is true. And, um, and so I, I am very passionate about at least, um, let, at least giving people the opportunity to hear the best possible defense of Christianity before they leave the Christian faith. Right. And I think a lot of people don't, and you can kind of see this um, by some of the things that they say. I mean, I've seen skeptics just say like the craziest things online. Sometimes they'll like criticize the Trinity and it's like, that's not the Trinity. You just criticized modalism, you know, and, and things like that. And so um, sometimes it seems like a lot of times people will leave something that they maybe didn't fully hear the best arguments for both theologically or, or just the historical evidence and so forth. So absolutely. Now, is this somebody for um, just Christians who are struggling with doubts? Is there anybody else who could benefit from it? Well, we often have ex-Christians that contact us as well. So if you've already left the Christian faith, then you're very welcome to contact us and set up a conversation to explore whether there might be a way back to faith and whether your reasons for loss of faith were truly rational. And we're very open to having those conversations with you. Um, also, if, you're, if you've never been a Christian, but you're just interested in, you're sincerely interested in exploring uh, the evidences for Christianity, then you're also very welcome to reach out to us uh, through our website, talkaboutdoubts.com, and we would be very glad to uh, facilitate a conversation with you about the evidences. We're not, well, one thing that we're not is an informal debate club, though. So if you're just looking for like a, a debate uh, and you've already, you know, more or less come to your conclusion, then uh, I'd suggest perhaps looking elsewhere because uh, that's not really what we're about. Um, and so, yeah, the, these are the, the sorts of people that I think could benefit from our work. Cool, cool. So what have been some of the early returns on the project so far? Like, how's it been? How long has it been going? And what have you seen so far? Yeah, so talkaboutdoubts.com launched in December uh, of 2021. And we've had over, um, well over 100 requests so far. We've had to date, um, we have had 113 requests for a conversation. And um, uh, we so we, we've had we've had requests from co for conversations from people who are struggling with that from ex Christians and also from uh, people who are in ministry who are struggling with faith or have lost their faith and they're still in ministry and we've also had requests from parents as well whose um, sons or daughters have, have left the faith and I've, we've had a lot of really encouraging testimonials from people people seem to have really been impacted by our ministry and it's given people confidence in the truth of Christianity and uh, addressed many of their concerns and doubts that they had. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that that's um, some, some of the, our encouraging returns so far. With one, one person that I um, mentored through my, when the performance on my personal website actually returned to faith um, in part as a result of this uh, endeavor as well. So that's also something that we um, celebrate. Yeah, definitely. That's that's awesome, man. And so I want to get into kind of like some of the reasons why people doubt and whether these are rational doubts or good reasons to doubt. And so um, you said a lot of times the deconstruction stories you watched, um, a lot of times they didn't have maybe the best reasons. And so I, I guess what would be some of the most common reasons that you saw um, in watching all of these different testimonies and talking to different people on why people leave the faith? Yeah, I mean, it's a very diverse community. Uh, as I've often said, if you talk to one deconvert, you've talked to one deconvert because the, the reasons people have for deconverting are so diverse. Uh, but uh, 
I mean, there are people that's primary issue is uh, New Testament issues. Perhaps they run into a Bar Ehrman or a Richard Carrier or, or another you know, atheist author, and they really are, don't have a good grounding or foundation in the rational defense of the Christian faith. And therefore, they're completely flummoxed when they run into those things. Or, uh, or often, a problem of evil is a significant contributor, especially if someone's actually experienced evil in their own lives and their own experience. Uh, also, the related problem of divine hiddenness would also be as, um, a, a very, uh, uh, very popular topic as far as people's reasons for leaving their faith is concerned. Um, and also, a lot of people leave their faith for not so much rational reasons, but emotional reasons. Uh, there, there's such a thing as emotional doubt, and that often goes hand in hand with uh, underlying mental health issues such as OCD and anxiety. Do you find on the people on the emotional side of things, um, are they normally like plugged into a church? Have they been talking to their pastors at all? And are they just not finding that help from their pastors? Or or have they just not taken that step yet because maybe they're afraid? Or I, I don't know, maybe that's kind of a, a strange question. Maybe you haven't had that come across it too much, but like what, what happens there? Yeah, I mean, it varies. Uh, that that's something that I would ask someone though who's struggling with emotional doubts, particularly, is uh, have you talked to your pastor about this, or are you involved in the local church? And uh, answers on that, of course, vary. Yeah, right on. So on the blog, um, which is a great resource, it's jonathanmcclatchy.com um, for everybody. Which again, I'll link in the description. Um, you talk about the need for cognitive closure in, in an article of yours and how that can be an obstacle for people thinking really clear about Christianity. And so this could be like a need or a tendency um, with for some to, to walk in the faith. They just have this need of cognitive closure. And because they don't have it, they, they step away. And so uh, what, what do you mean by cognitive closure? And how can those with this uh, need for it um, remain intellectually honest with themselves without like letting it really kind of drive them away? Yeah, so the need for cognitive closure is a need that many people have uh, for answers, or satisfactory answers to all questions that can be raised about their worldview before they can be content in their belief set. And I would argue that one does not need to be to, to have complete and to have full and satisfactory answers to all questions that can be raised about one's belief set in order to be uh, confident in one's uh, system of belief. So I, for example, I like to distinguish, first of all, between questions and objections. Not all questions are objections. Questions, of course, express objections sometimes, but for a question to become an objection, you, did, you, you need an additional premise, either that we, um, we do know the answer and that entails some sort of uh, internal incoherence or is at odds with empirical data, or we don't know the answer in a Christianity which we should expect to know the answer. Uh, short of that extra premise, a question is only a question. So one question that sometimes comes up in my talk about Dao's ministry is what happens to those who've never heard the gospel? What about the Amazonian tribesmen, for, for instance? And one of the things I'll say there is, okay, let's suppose for the sake of argument that we just don't know what God's arrangements are for such people? Well, okay, it's an interesting question, but it's hardly an objection, right? Um, if we have adequate grounds to think that God is just, that God is cute, then we can trust that he has some sort of arrangement in place, which will align with his attributes. Uh, and so even if we don't ex know exactly what God's arrangements are in such a situation, uh, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be considered, uh, it shouldn't be taken to be a, a grave blow against Christianity. Um, I also like to uh, encourage people to distinguish between low and high stake objections because not all objections are high stakes. So an example of a low stakes objection, for example, would be an objection to uh, young earth creationism, for example, which you know, Christian, Christians can reasonably disagree about the interpretation of the early chapters of Genesis. Hmm. And so, in my view, because there are sufficiently plausible uh, hermeneutical frameworks for understanding the early chapters of Genesis, which are consistent with an old earth, 
and there's sufficient evidence to think that Christianity is in fact true, in my view, one is more rational in moving from young earth creationism to old earth creationism rather, th rather than from young earth creationism to rejecting Christianity. So that's a, a very common one that, that comes up is people grew up in these very rigid conservative environments and then and they're, they're basically they're, they're, their church essentially equates Christianity with young earth creationism and then they go to university and find that there's actually a lot of evidence scientifically against young earth creationism and so rather than just revising their hermeneutical framework they chuck out Christianity right, and right. There, there are plenty of other examples of that another example would be the um, doctrine of eternal conscious torment um, and one can have a, people often have moral objections to the doctrine of eternal conscious torment and regardless of what one thinks about that topic I think that there are sufficiently plausible interpretations of scripture which don't commit one to affirming eternal conscious torment but you, you could take a, a conditionalist view or sometimes called an annihilationist view which was defended perhaps most prominently by uh, John Stott um, the late great theologian and so if one uh, was particularly concerned about that issue i think that we have sufficient reason to think christianity is true and there's sufficiently plausible uh, hermeneutical approaches to the text of scripture which would be consistent with an annihilationist perspective that one would be more rational in moving from the traditionalist view of hell to a more annihilationist view uh, rather than rejecting christianity uh, so um that that i think and, and also another one is um the um, another low stakes objection that's often mistaken for a high stakes objection is an objection to inerrancy. And um, basically, there's, I mean, there's two senses in which one can talk about inerrancy, right? There's, there's um, you might call it strong inerrancy and weak inerrancy. Strong inerrancy is essentially the view that not only are there no errors in scripture, but there can be no errors in scripture. And if you were to find a single error in scripture, the whole edifice of Christianity would just shatter. And that sets up a very brittle view of Christianity. It sets a very low bar for the skeptic to attain to in order to demonstrate that Christianity is false. Because you just the, the Bible's a big book. <laughs> it's it's, a, it's there's there's a lot there to go after, right? If you want to, um, I, I think that inerrancy is not a high stakes issue, but there is a high stakes issue in the vicinity, and that is reliability of Scripture. So I think that Scripture, uh, I, I think that the Scriptures are demonstrably reliable documents and not all hypothesized errors are of equivalent epistemic weight mm -hmm. right there are some uh, hypothesized errors which would be of graver consequence than others so for instance i distinguish between um as as i know you, you yourself do and lydia mcgrew has done between a, um, a, a, a good faith error which is like a minor it might be a um minor variation in witness memory or something along those lines versus deliberate distortion of fact if we right. if it if we if, if it came to light that the gospel authors for example were manufacturing entire discourses entire scenes or pericopes in the gospels that would be very very concerning but it's and that would be far more concerning than if it were if it were the case that there are some uh, occasional minor good faith mistakes for example it's, it's a lot easier to forget what day of the week an event happened than it is to for, um just completely uh, uh man manufacture um uh um, a pericope or an, a scenario or a, a discourse of jesus and so forth so that's an important distinction i think to make as well um Right. Yeah. And there are some people who we, we know will say that that still fits within inerrancy that it's like, dude, let's let's just be honest. That's that's not inerrancy. So or anything close to it or even reliability. It's just them making stuff up. And so uh, but anyways, that's a whole other subject that we could definitely um, probably dive into. But how does a believer make that distinction? How how do you tell between what's a low stakes and a high stakes objection? Like where where does that differentiation happen? Yeah, so uh, I, I would say that the core propositions of Christianity would include you know, the death of Christ, of course, the, the resurrection of Christ, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, um, the historicity of Jesus, uh, uh, the historicity of the Exodus, and so forth. Uh, as I said, I think that the reliability of Scripture is a high-stakes objection. So I'm not 
saying that we can just start chucking things and chuck out the Exodus and chuck out David and chuck out the conquest narratives and um, and so forth. I, I'm saying that that I, I think that we can be accommodating of minor good faith mistakes in scripture. And if we have sufficient, if, if we have a justified confidence that in G, indeed Jesus existed, not only did he exist, but he died uh, by crucifixion, he was executed by the Romans, and then on the third day he was raised from the dead, and we have, um, ev um, we have evidence for his, um, independent of that, for his messianic and divine self-identity, the trilemma argument, for example, that was developed by C.S. Lewis, I think is quite powerful, which is to say that um, Christ claimed to be God, he, and th that the evidence for that seems to me to be quite compelling. And if he either he was God or he wasn't, and if he wasn't, either he knew he wasn't or he didn't. And uh, the fact that he was willing to get himself crucified is evidence um, of his sincerity. And there's a very small reference class of people that are um, they are able to be honestly mistaken that they're actually the creator of the universe and the Yahweh of the Old Testament. So that again contributes evidence for Jesus' messianic identity. And you've also got the the um, arguments from predictive prophecy, in particular messianic prophecy, and so forth. And so you have a, a, a justified confidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be, and that uh, um, allows you to then um, work out some of the more uh, the, the the more in-house theological debates, such as you know, Calvinism versus Arminianism, or old Earth versus young Earth, or um, different views of hell, different views of eschatology, and so forth. So there are issues which are interesting to talk about, but which Christians can uh, can reasonably disagree. And then there are more fundamental issues which strike at the, the very heart of Christianity. Um, and anything to add to that, Eric? No, I mean, it, not really other than, I mean, it, it seems to me like the core issues are clear. And when people talk about like the perspicuity of scripture, which is a fancy word for just saying that scripture is clear, um, I think it's even in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which I'm not particularly ultra reformed or anything, but um, it talks about that which is basically necessary for salvation is clear in scripture. And that which necessarily, what isn't necessarily essential for salvation, um, it seems like they leave some room for uh, reasonable disagreement and different things like that. And so I think a lot of skeptics get this idea that like scripture should be ultra clear on every single like issue. There should be no denominations or anything like that. I know people can kind of get shook up, like why so many denominations and different things like that. But it seems to me like the very core issues are something that uh, no reasonable Christian can disagree with. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Um, one question I wanted to ask you, and I get this a lot, and I don't know if you get this, but I get people um, emailing me, you know, messaging me over Facebook because they know of my channel and different things like that. And these are like often new converts who will just totally immerse themselves in like skeptical blogs and YouTube channels. And then they just feel overwhelmed by the sheer amount of objections that are just being thrown out there by skeptics. Um, and so what do you say to somebody who finds himself in this kind of a position? Sure. That's a good question. I, I would, first of all, encourage that when investigating any proposition, whether we're dealing with Christianity or evolution or climate change or whatever it happens to be, we should investigate the positive case first before going to explore the negative case, because all scientific theories have anomalous data, data that doesn't quite fit the paradigm. And there, for any complex subject, there's going to be evidence both for and against the idea in question. And if we only focus on the anomalous data, I mean, that, that's how conspiracy theories get started, right? Uh, if we only focus on the anomalous data, then we're going to have a very misguided perception of where the evidence lies. Uh, I think that when we look at the vast array of positive confirmatory evidences that support the Christian faith, we, uh, we, are, it, we, uh, we are built for ourselves a framework which allows us to contextualize the more difficult aspects. And there, there, are, some there are some aspects of the Christian faith which are difficult. Um, uh, some of the more violent texts in the Old Testament, for example, are difficult to understand. Uh, the problem of evil is difficult to understand. Um, but when you 
are able to contextualize that within the positive case, it then allows you to um, not be completely uh, um, not not uh, completely panic when you come across a new piece of evidence which tends to disconfirm Christianity because you you you're you're able to think about the big picture. One common fallacy that people commit, which was coined by uh, Richard Whateley in his mm -hmm. uh, Elements of Logic, he was a Christian philosopher who lived in the 1700s, is the um, fallacy of objections, where one becomes so fixated on the objections that one doesn't have a satisfactory answer to that one misses the force for the trees and misses the avalanche of evidence that tends to confirm the Christian faith. And I think a lot of people tend to do that. And the question is not, or should not be, whether there are objections to Christianity that there are no satisfactory answers to. Rather, the question ought to be, are there more numerous and more substantive objections to believing the gospel or not believing the gospel? And in my judgment, there are far more numerous and far more substantive objections to disbelieving the gospel than there are to believing it to be true. So I, I'd also encourage people uh, to focus on one issue at a time mm -hmm. rather than trying to cover everything at once because there's just such a wealth of literature in all topics. And uh, if you try to cover everything, you're just going to have a very shallow understanding of everything. Uh, I would encourage people to start with one topic. So, for example, one friend of mine that I've been mentoring, uh, I, um, he's just focusing on the Gospel of John for a while and trying to investigate the evidence for his authorship, pro and con. And uh, you can just take a topic like that, make it a, a, a narrow topic, and just focus on learning all of the arguments on both sides of the debate and trying to come to an honest conclusion and then move on to the next thing and, and so forth. So try to uh, do your investigation in a disciplined way rather than an, an undisciplined way. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it definitely does. And that's probably one of the things that I encourage people to do a lot too, is just focus on one thing at a time. Um, don't just throw yourself into the, the deep end and immerse yourself with every single objection that skeptics are going to throw out there because you're just going to get tired. You're just going to get overwhelmed at this point. Um, and especially if you're a newer believer, you ought to be taking the time to be investigating the positive evidence, as you mentioned first, and really get that under your belt and get a good understanding of it. And if you're not aware of where to find that positive evidence, well, uh, go to your blog, uh, check out more of my channel. Um, I have videos where I recommend different books and things like that. Um, but I find a lot of times these people aren't just really very well versed in even what the positive evidence is. And so why are you, if your faith is something that is precious to you, um, I'm not saying hide from the objections. I'm not saying never expose yourself to the objections. I'm saying get the positive evidence at least under your belt first, and then allow it to be scrutinized by some of the more difficult objections that could be raised against it. Um, I wouldn't tell somebody who's new in their faith, uh, here's a list of Bart Ehrman books. I would probably give them evident, uh, books that are in favor of Christianity first. And then once you read those Bart Ehrman books, you're going to be able to see through a lot of the things that Bart is saying and Bart is doing uh, in them. And it doesn't mean that Dr. Ehrman or others don't raise difficult objections, but you'll find that they aren't nearly as like scary at that point. Um, they're just something that it's just like, oh, well, that's easily resolved here. I've already seen the answer to this. Um, or I know, you know, such and such person references here. And I know, I know where to find those answers so that when there is something that you can't answer, um, you, you just realize that like, okay, well, like you said, every worldview is going to have some anomalous data that you just can't quite explain but there's just way more on the positive side than on the negative that it just doesn't, it just lands different when you hear it. I don't have every single issue in my head, like perfectly resolved. Um, but it, I, I have so much more on the positive side that when I do hear something, I'm not shaken. It just means, okay, that's something that I need to put on the shelf. And at some time, whether it's now or later, really take the time to examine and, and nail it to the wall. Um, and if I can't, then that's okay because I still have more positive than the negative. Does that make sense? You Absolutely. Completely agree with agree that? everything you said. So, um, but I, I mean, when I was new to apologetics and I first heard a lot of objections, it just completely shook me. Um, and so I had to go and find 
what are some of the best resources um, and, and digest those. And then it wasn't, again, something that's so scary. So speaking of which, I mean, it kind of segues into what I might ask you next here, but like, what are some of the best resources? Who, who are, what are some of the, um, let's just say for the reliability of the gospels, for example, like, mm. Who do you who do you recommend people read after and, and study um, for that particular topic? Sure. So on the reliability of the Gospels, particularly, I'd recommend all of Lydia McGrew's books. For one, uh, she uh, has written three books, uh, at least a solo author of three books. Um, those are um, her first book, Hidden in Plain View, Undesigned Coincidences in the Gospel of the Next. And then her second book, The Mirror or the Mask, Liberating the Gospels from Literary Devices. And her third book, The Eye of the Beholder, The Gospel of John is Historical Reportage. So I highly recommend those books. I also recommend Peter J. Williams' book, Can We Trust the Gospels? Uh, I think that is uh, worth reading. I also would recommend Richard Balcom's book, uh, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, uh, the Gospels. Um, uh, the Gospels as Eyewitness accounts. Um, I'd also recommend. Um, uh, I'd also recommend William Paley's work. Uh, he he was a famous uh, Christian philosopher. He's most famous for his natural theology, but he also was a theologian, and uh, um, he did a lot of really excellent work on biblical scholarship and. I highly recommend his book, uh, A View of the Evidence of Christianity. And I also recommend his book, um, uh, Horae Polonae, which is uh, on the letters of Paul. It's a Latin title. It means uh, the times of Paul, literally, and is on undesigned coincidences between the Book of Acts and the letters of Paul. I also recommend Colin Hemer's work on the Book of Acts, uh, the Book of Acts in the Setting of Hellenistic History. Uh, also, uh, Craig Keener's four volume set on the Book of Acts is also excellent. Uh, Craig Blumberg's work also, his book on the reliability of the Gospel of John, his book on the reliability of the Gospels, and his book on the reliability of the New Testament, uh, mm -hmm. all uh, excellent books. So there's uh, a few recommendations that I would that I would suggest. I have all of those books and I would uh, give a hearty amen on, on all of those books. Um, Bauckham's book, I would throw a few caveats out there, but- um, sure. I won't, bore, I, wouldn't bore, I won't bore you guys with the exact details on that, but uh, Liddy McGrew has a couple of ex excellent blog posts uh, reviewing Bauckham's book for those who are interested. It's on what's wrong with the world.net. You can just Google it and if you want to know um, what some of the caveats that I'm talking about are, then you can go ahead and check that out. And so um, what are some, I, I know some Christians, they will watch these um these YouTubers or, or find these different podcasts and things like that. And they'll be debunking um, certain arguments for like the existence of God or the resurrection or different things like that. And sometimes they'll come to me and be like, Hey, could you respond to this? And I'm like, well, to begin with, those aren't really good arguments. And so um, I guess what I'm trying to ask, and maybe not the clearest way here, but um, what are some arguments that you would say Christians shouldn't really put, too much of their their stock in so that if they do hear a skeptic kind of poke holes in the argument that they're not like upset or frazzled by by hearing these things does that uh, make sense yeah uh so the first thing that pops into my head is the minimal facts <laughs> approach to defending the resurrection of jesus uh that is uh, an argument that was developed and popularized by gary habermas and also by michael lacuna and the, basically, the argument is that uh, they limit the people who are per exponents of the minimal facts defense of the resurrection will limit their data set when making the case for the resurrection to those facts which can be not only justified with the historical evidence as they view it, but also enjoy more than 90% of support from critical scholars across the theological spectrum. And one of the problems with that, of course, as Lydia McGrew has pointed out, is that when Gary Habermas, for instance, is pressed on the hallucination hypothesis or the hypothesis of objective vision, Habermas will rest his case on the fact that uh, group hallucinations don't typically occur. 
and are, are immensely improbable because usually hallucinatory experiences are individual, private, personal experiences. They're not shared experiences. And the problem, though, is that that's no longer a minimal fact because that's not something that's agreed upon by more than 90% of critical scholars, the group appearances, that is. And certainly the polymodal or multi-sensory nature of the resurrection encounters that are reported in the Gospels and Acts would not be part of the, the minimal facts. And it becomes very difficult, I think, if you want to repose the entire weight of the case on 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, as Gary Habermas tends to do, then it becomes very difficult to evaluate the rationality of the disciples' belief mm -hmm. in coming to the conclusion that Jesus was raised from the dead. Because if we can't say what the experiences were like, then we don't know what it was that propelled them to believe that Jesus, in fact, had been raised from the dead. So I, I'm not saying that First Corinthians 15, 3 through 7 is of no evidential value, but I think that one shouldn't rest the entire case on, on the polling corpus, although I think it does contribute evidential value in building the case. I also think that Gary Habermas has a tendency to date first the, the, the pre polling creed that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7 earlier than can be justified by the evidence. I mean, it's plausible that 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, where um, Paul says that you know, um, what I received, I pass on to you as a first importance that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, he was buried, he was raised again in the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and so forth. And he talks about the, appearance, the various appearances. It's plausible that that goes back to within you know, the first couple of years of the of the church. It's, it's plausible that he received that creed when he goes to Jerusalem three years after his conversion is recounted in Galatians uh, chapter one. But we don't know that. Um, that's 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 intelligent conjecture. We, we just don't know. I, I have an essay actually on my website where I review the evidence for the uh, first Corinthians 15, three through seven being a pre Pauline creed, which I think is more likely than not. And I also review the evidence for its dating, which I think we really can't say when that creed dates to. What you can say though, is that in verse 11, Paul says, whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so we believed. And so it seems likely that the Corinthians understood Paul's preaching concerning the resurrection to be consistent with what had already been preached by the other apostles, in particular, Peter and James and the 12 and so on. And we have independent reason to think that the Corinthians were acquainted with the preaching of Peter because in verse Corinthians one, he says that there are divisions of factions in your midst. Some say I follow Kephas, others Apollos, others I follow Paul, others I follow Christ, and so on. So it, it seems likely, just from reading the letters of Paul, that the original apostles, the Jerusalem apostles, in particular Peter and the Twelve and James, believed that they had had such experiences, and that's what their preaching was. But we can't really say much about what those experiences were like. In fact, as has often been pointed out, uh, Gerd Ludemann, for example, makes this point that uh, who's an atheist, uh, um, New Testament, who was an atheist New Testament scholar, um, that the, it, Paul uses the same word "opthe" to describe both the apostles' experience and his own experience. And yet, we know from Paul's own writing that his experience was not of the sort of which we read in the Gospels. Right? Mm -hmm. He uh, he just. Uh, uh, he, and, and even the Book of Acts, that seems to be the case. He he had, it was not of the sort of tangible physical encounter that we read of in, in the Gospels as happening with the other apostles. And so, in order to show that the experiences were qualitatively diff different, at least um, in a conclusive way, I would argue that you have to appeal to the Book of Acts and argue that that um, Luke was a traveling companion of Paul and Luke reports that um, Luke, and we also we have uh, Luke, the companion volume to Acts, which is the gospel of Luke, report, certainly reports that the disciples had those physical, tangible encounters with the risen Jesus. He reports long discourses like the Emmaus disciples on the road to, uh, the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus having a long discourse with Jesus and so on. It seems, it, was, it would seem surprising that they would have such a different perspective that Luke would have such a different perspective from Paul on the nature of the experiences of the apostles, at least as, as was being claimed by the apostles, given that Luke was a traveling companion of Paul and he had access to the living witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. He met, he meets with them, for example, in Acts 
21, where he goes to the Jerusalem Council and all the elders, including James, who specifically named, are present. Um, so the, the minimal facts, um, I think, is a weak argument. Also, um, another issue I have with the minimal facts is that Gary Habermas, I, I, I'm not, I, it doesn't seem that he really dif differentiates clearly between, so when, when he's counting up noses among New Testament scholars as to who affirms what fact, he doesn't really distinguish carefully, it seems to me, between someone who might say that uh, it's plausible that the apostles had experiences versus, yes, the apostles almost certainly had experiences. Um, mm -hmm. So that's also an important distinction to make, and it's not clear that Habermas does that. So th these are just some, a few of my concerns with the minimal facts approach. Yeah, definitely. And um, for those of you who are familiar with this channel, um, you probably see my um, series of videos on the minimal facts, but if you haven't, um, I'll also go ahead and put that in the description, um, other problems with the minimal facts. But I mean, yeah, th there's a lot of things that are compatible with 1 Corinthians 15, you know, like Lydia said, a, a floating Jesus who just sits there for a minute and then disappears is compatible with 1 Corinthians 15. And so um, I definitely think that it's an argument that a, a apologist shouldn't use. And it's kind of sad because you do see skeptics who are like, well, yeah, I became even more skeptical the more I studied some Christian apologetics, and that obviously should not not be the case. Um, one of the things, though, that I think that probably you and I, who would take more of a maximal data approach, is um, they'll say, well, yeah, but there are people who uh, are in academia and in, in the universities um, who are aware of the Gospels, and they're not uh, convinced that they're very reliable. They think they're very unreliable. And so, um, you know, why are more biblical scholars not, you know, conservative kind of Christians like you and I, um, if, you know, why are they so many intellectual people rejecting kind of that stance? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think that the whole discipline of New Testament studies is plagued with bad standards and that the whole discipline, frankly, is a mess. And uh, uh, a lot of it essentially needs to be scrapped and redone because it's such a mess. Um, so a lot of people I've spoken with are very impressed with consensus of critical scholars. And I, I'm less impressed the more uh, New Testament scholarship that I read or biblical scholarship more broadly that I read because there are so many instances where the scholarly consensus says one thing and then I look at the evidence that compels that consensus and the evidence turns out not to be very good. In fact, often there's compelling evidence the other way. An example of that would be the pastoral letters and their mm -hmm. authorship, yeah. um, which I've written a, a, a lengthy essay on on my website. Uh, I, I, didn't, I did a review of some of the uh, scholarship. So I, I reviewed, for example, um, Bart Ehrman's book, Forgery and Counterforgery, which is a scholarly book where he looks at the the so-called Zetapicrypha and arguments against their authorship uh, by the traditional authorship. And I showed that actually, essentially all of his arguments are terrible. And actually there's some compelling arguments going the other direction that suggest that Paul, in fact, wrote the pastoral letters for Timothy, Second Timothy and Titus. Um, I mean, uh, there's examples in the Old Testament. Like I think that the documentary hypothesis with respect to the Pentateuch, for example, is just a, a complete mess of an argument. Um, and yeah, there's, there's lots that one could say on that. Um, I recommend um, uh, William Henry Green's book on, on the high criticism of the Pentateuch, if people are interested in exploring that further. Uh, also, Kenneth Kitchen has some uh, good things to say on that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also Gleason Archer's work, his uh, Old Testament introduction has some really good things to say on the documentary hypothesis. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not impressed by, scholar, by, by the consensus of scholarship. And I think that a lot, there's a lot of bad assumptions such as um, anti-supernatural bias that unfortunately colors a lot of biblical scholarship. Um, are, I've also written a, an extensive essay, as you know, on my website on the dating of the book of Daniel. And the majority of the arguments that are used for the Hellenistic rather than Neo-Babylonian dating of Daniel are not very good. And actually there's some compelling arguments the other direction in my view. So yeah, ho hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's funny that you bring up the the pastoral epistles because that was the this um, 
subject that I studied when I first was kind of reading more of the other side, I guess. And I was just like, wow, these arguments are really bad. Like, like just really bad. I mean, they're, they're talking about, you know, Paul's use of the word faith is different than what it would be in, um, like say Romans or something like that. And yet he does use the word faith, like he does in Timothy and other different places. And, um, like he, he uses it in Philippians, um, that they're standing firm in the faith and, and it's, it's just, I, I don't know. It was a mess. And then the more I read Bart Ehrman, I tell people this is like, it, it almost strengthens my faith because there's so many, like just bad mm -hmm. arguments that he, that he throws out there. And you're right about this anti-supernatural bias. I can't remember which class it was. It was on iTunes University, but it was a class on the historical Jesus. And the, the guy just came out there and said, well, we know miracles don't happen. So, and then he went into the point of how this particular story couldn't be true. And I just was like, are you really going to be, oop, I hit my microphone there. Are you really going to be that obvious <laughs> and like just sit out and say it like that? But you, you actually read some of these scholars like Gerd Ludemann just flat out says like, hey, like miracles don't happen. We can't believe this in a scientific age. Therefore, there's got to be this, that, and the other. And so um, I, I agree with you 100%. The more I read some of these scholars, the less impressed that I am with them. I think you reviewed a, uh, uh, a Yale University class. What was the name of the Dale yeah, Martin? Yeah, that was Dale Martin <laughs> yeah. at Yale University. And he just makes so many just flat out errors on New Testament scholarship. And he's teaching this uh, freshman introductory class on on New Testament studies. And I, I was shocked by how ill-informed he was about these topics. And yeah, and another example, of course, is the, uh, of what, what we're talking about is the supposed anonymity of the gospels, which, which is the consensus view that the traditional authorship of the gospels is incorrect. They're not technically, anonymous because they don't name the authors but they but they're it said that they're anonymous meaning that we, we just don't know who wrote them and that the the authors didn't uh, is, is not the, the authors themselves don't claim uh, a particular identity and i mean the the arguments for that suck when you i mean every single manuscript that we have which is sufficiently complete that we have the first and the last page has the name of the traditional author written on it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Now, so we don't have, of course, the original autographs of any of those documents. So we just don't know whether the names were originally on the manuscripts or not. And it seems unlikely that Luke was anonymous because he's addressing an official by the name of Theophilus. You think Theophilus didn't, had no idea who was writing to him? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a terrible, and I mean, John's gospel, um, for, uh, for the uh, John's gospel is written, almost everyone agrees, was written by the same individual as wrote First John, whoever that individual was. And First John, the prologue clearly claims to be an eyewitness to Jesus' public ministry. And also John's gospel itself uh, um, implies that it was written by an eyewitness. Uh, he says uh, at the end of the gospel that this is speaking about the beloved disciple. This is a disciple who is witness these things and has written them down and so forth. And there, and then we can evaluate whether that testimony is likely to be true. And we can cross check a lot of the very specific and particular details in the gospel of John. And many of these very specific details, so many of which don't actually appear in the synoptics, turn out to be verifiable historically. And that tends to support that the author really is an eyewitness. And then you can make a case for him being the beloved disciple. Uh, if people are interested in like a detailed analysis of that topic, I highly recommend Lydia McGrew's book, The Eye of the Beholder, The Gospel of John's Historical Reportage, which lays out the case for Jehanian authorship. I also recommend Brooke Westcott's commentary on the Gospel according to St. John, which also lays out a very formidable case for the traditional authorship of the fourth gospel. Yeah, definitely. Those are um, excellent resources and uh, um, I totally agree there. They are really weak objections. And I, like I said, it's just the more you read critical scholarship after, and, and again, this just kind of goes back to what I was emphasizing before. If you're new to the faith, you don't need to be throwing yourself into the deep end and listening to all the objections that could be said against it. Get these books that Jonathan and I are referring to. Um, check out Lydia McGrew's channel. She's got also a lot of really good information on there that's just for free. If you can't afford it, a, a lot of these older books like William Paley, 
are things that are um, public domain that you can just go on Google Play and download for absolutely free. It's not going to cost you a dime. And these arguments, people might say, well, they're older arguments. Well, a lot of these older arguments, um, they may have fallen out of fashion, but that doesn't mean that they're wrong just because of their age. A lot, a lot of the things that they argue still hold up, and I think hold up very strongly. And so, um, so check these things out. And then when you go and you read these scholars uh, like Bart Ehrman, or you listen to Dale Martin, or you listen to Dale Allison, uh, and some of these other um, scholars that skeptics are just throwing out there and saying, these are such amazing scholars, you find out that a lot of the things that they say just really aren't very compelling or very strong. And so um, finally, I think we could wrap things up here, but one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is that sometimes I find skeptics throw the word apologist out there like it's like a slur, you know, um, and, and maybe because it's, as we've said earlier, there is a lot of bad apologic, apologetics out there, um, even by people who I think, you know, have PhDs at the end of their name. And so it's kind of looked at as a position that's kind of closed off to open-minded inquiry. And, you know, somebody's already made the conclusion and they're just going to defend the faith at all costs in the faith, uh, in the face of, you know, any counter evidence that's thrown at them. And so I think this is a huge misconception. You've talked about this kind of in your blog. And so, um, yeah, go ahead and address that real quick, if you would. Yeah. So uh, it's often... Uh believed by many outside the church and also unfortunately by many Christians as well that apologetics is somehow contrary to open-ended inquiry that you start with a conclusion and then you just engage in confirmation bias and motivated reasoning trying to shore up those conclusions which are actually accepted a priori and I, I do think that that is what apologetics is or what it uh, historically has been rather uh, apologetics is not contrary to open-ended inquiry but it is coextensive it, it's, it's not identical with co open-ended inquiry but it's not um it, but, but, it, but it is coextensive with it so what i mean by that is that uh, apologetics is what happens when the results from open-ended inquiry are in and now you are publishing your evidence and your interpretation of that evidence for for popular consumption and apologetics can be done well and apologetics can be done badly just as science can be done well and science can be done badly uh, when charles darwin published the Origin of species in 1859 i would consider that a work of apologetics uh, it doesn't mean that it's bad scholarship it's just a label that we give a defense of a particular perspective someone is trying to give you the reasons that brought them to the conclusion that they've arrived at. Uh, I, I think it's a mistake to view apologetics as, uh, as a sh uh, or the role of an apologist as assuming the role of a criminal defense attorney. That is, that where, where Christianity is the client and you are trying to defend that client come what may. Uh, that is, I think, a mistaken view of apologetics. Rather, we are to assume the role of an investigative journalist reporting for popular consumption, the results of a fair and balanced inquiry. So I, I highly recommend a book by uh, Julia Galef called The Scout Mindset, where she basically distinguishes between two sorts of mindset. There's soldier mindset and there's scout mindset. Soldier mindset is essentially motivated reasoning, where someone is out trying to defend their team, trying to defend their side, come what may. And then the better mode of reasoning, the better mindset, if you will, is the scout mindset where the, and the scout is out trying to discover and discern how the world really is so they can be better informed, so they can acquire a better map of reality. And I actually have a review of that, a book review of that book on my website, if you're interested. And I also talk about, even though Julie Gill is an atheist herself, I think that we as Christian apologists have a lot that we can learn from her. And so I talk in my essay about some of the important lessons that we can draw for our apologetics from Julia Gale's work. Yeah, definitely. No, that's that's excellent. And so um, I've just kind of run, in that, run into that quite a bit. You see it on social media, like the word uh, apologist or pop apologist is often thrown out as a slur. And I find that um, it kind of reminds me of, uh, I'm, even though I don't subscribe to a lot of the philosophy of uh, Alvin Plantinga, it's kind of, well, I don't want to say the word that Alvin uses because uh, 
it's not super Christian, but it's basically when somebody calls somebody a fundamentalist, it's just kind of like saying a, a son of a, and I find that sometimes people use pop apologist is just basically somebody who disagrees with me, but it's also like, like I said, used by just somebody who's just a motivated reasoner, who's just working backwards. Um, and that's not the case if you do it well. Um, and so you, we all should be open to updating our beliefs in the light of new evidence. Um, and we should be doing a thorough job. And, and as people's lives are at stake in terms of like their eternal destinies, well, then we owe it to them to really study, uh, as Paul talks about, to study, as, to show yourself approved, to really look at what can be said uh, for your view and then what can actually be said against it and exposing yourself to those things and presenting people um, with even the weaknesses in your view or the things that maybe you haven't been able to fully resolve yet or, or things that could be said against it and you're not hiding things from them and all of that so um so awesome man i, I really appreciate you taking the time um we're running up on that hour here and so um we could just finish up do you have anything any other advice um out there that you would say to somebody who's uh, struggling with doubts and then also just kind of where again can people find the website and find uh, your published work as well and and just we'll just close out with that sure i mean the website is talkaboutdoubts.com and uh, i also have a personal website jonathanpapachi.com that houses a lot of my essays and writing uh, so check out both of those resources. If you are struggling with doubt, then I or one of my team would love to chat with you about uh, your doubts and help you to develop a protocol for working through doubts in an intellectually responsible way and also to address any concerns or doubts that you have about the Christian faith and, of course, to share with you the massive uh, uh, evidence that we have that confirms Christianity. So please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. It's completely free service. You don't have to pay anything. We're not looking for your money. We just are here to help you walk through your uh, your faith crisis. And uh, we are also hopefully uh, starting this summer, potentially, we are planning to host uh, occasional weekend retreats for talkaboutdoubts.com, where we will have uh, um, a, an intensive retreat weekend where you can come and uh, we will bring in a few of our scholars and experts and we'll have uh, uh, seminars and workshops and talks and panel Q and A's and meals uh, throughout the weekend. So we're excited to start that. So stay tuned uh, for that and um, we'll uh, make further announcements through uh, social media when uh, the time comes to do that. So um, anyway, that I'll, I'll finish with that. But thanks so much, uh, Eric, for um, having me on. It's been a real uh, honor to be on with you. Yeah, absolutely, man. I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, yeah, it's been awesome. And so, um, all right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us um, and for this uh, interview. And again, I will link all kinds of resources from Jonathan in the description down below. And I'll pin a comment there as well so you can find that. And just thanks, everybody, so much for watching.